I'm sure they'll help you. I'd like to introduce this morning's keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Janet Tolan comes to us from the School of Information Management uh, in the University of Victoria, Wellington. Her research topics include sustainable information systems and the history of computing. Can you please join me in welcoming Janet Tolan to the stage? Okay. So, thank you very much for inviting me to um, PyCon. I'm very pleased to be here. And what I want to talk to you about today is um, history of computing, uh, my topic. So I'm just getting back to my slides, actually, which are down here somewhere. Yeah, so... Computing is quite a young profession. It's been around for about 60 years, but it does have um, some history. And one of the things that I was particularly interested in looking at is those early people, the first people who worked in computing, the pioneers. <coughs> they were very intelligent people, very committed, and they gave a lot of time to computing. But computing really came about at a very interesting time. It was the 1960s and the 1970s, there were very turbulent times politically, especially in the USA. There were things going on like the Vietnam War and civil rights, the hippie movement, that people had very strong feelings about. And that kind of hit the computing profession right at the beginning. And those first pioneers were very much thinking about, well, this is my working life and this is my personal life. All this stuff is going on around me in society, and what am I going to do about it? Do I bring the, the political events of the day and let that come into my work, or do I keep my sort of technical work very separate from my political beliefs? And people had very different views, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So it was relevant at that time, but also I think it's relevant to us today to think about some of those things. All right, the, the, the issues that we face are different today, but some of them, I think, have some resonance. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is really four main characters who were very inst instrumental in the setting up of computing's largest professional association, which is Association of Computing Machinery. So one of them was ACM's founder, Edmund Berkeley, who was its secretary for many years, and a man who had very strong, a very strong social conscience. Another person was Daniel McCracken, who was also very active in the ACM, and he too was the founder of Computers Against Anti-Ballistic Missiles. So he was very much against the use of computers in military applications. On the other side, if you like, the people who thought that you know, the professional work and political work could, could be kept separate, were Jean Samet, the first female president of the ACM, a very strong lady, and also Peter Denning, who was also an ACM president. So I want to talk about their views and how this all played out within the organisation and the discussions they had with each other. So three of the topics I'm going to look at is what they thought about the Vietnam War, um, what they thought about the equal rights of women, and also a big issue at the time was um, Soviet computer scientists who were being discriminated against in, the, in their own country. And I also want to look at one of the special interest groups that came out of the ACM, which was the special interest group for computers and society, and what kind of stand they took. So why look at Association of Computing Machinery? Well, it's the largest association, if you like, that there's also IEEE and others. It's got 100,000 members. At the time I'm looking at, 60s and 70s, mainly it was active in the USA, but today it's gone global. M half of the me members are outside the USA. It's got this huge resource of information about computing, the ACM Digital Library, if computing has a Nobel Prize, it's the Turing Award that's issued by um, ACM every year. It publishes a useful magazine, CACM, that you can go to to find out what's happening. 
It's got 37 special interest groups and there's 170 annual conferences. So it's a huge organisation. Now, you might be questioning at this point, I'm talking about computing as a profession. Now, a lot of people would say, well, it's not a profession. It's like an, a, just a loose grouping of different people who've got different interests and so on. It's, it's not really seen in this way. But the, the, the reason I'm talking about is profession is that those people who started the ACM, which is the people we're going to be looking at, really did want computing to be seen as a profession. It was a new technical thing. They realised it was something very exciting. And they thought, well, we want to form this association because we do want to have a voice within society as a group of technical e experts. We want to be seen as the people to, to go to. So they saw themselves, if you like, as the, as the founders of a profession. So I'm going along with that. So here we see a picture of Jean Samet, who I already mentioned was um, the first female ACM president. Obviously, she's uh, dressed in the fashions of the day. Um, but she's giving a statement which is, just kind of sums up what this talk is about. So on the one side, there's people within ACM who say, what we're about is science and educating society about science and also technical matters. And then at the other end, there's people who say, well, it's our moral duty as computer scientists who understand these things to comment on the social issues on, of the day. And this was what um, played out for them. So I was fortunate enough to carry out this research um, last year when I got some research and study leave for my um, university. And I'd just like to put in a little plug for Charles Babbage Institute, which is a big archive for the history of computing located in Minneapolis in the University of Minnesota. Uh, and I, I didn't know anything about Minneapolis before I went there, but it's a really lovely city. And if you get the chance, I urge you to go there. So basically, you've got the Mississippi River, river runs through the middle of the university campus. And by the side of the river, they've built a huge cavern in the ground. And in this cavern, the university and the city of Minneapolis just store hundreds and hundreds of archives. And those archives are in boxes. And you can get those boxes kind of brought up to the, the, the Charles Babbage Institute. is in a library that sits on top of that big hole in the ground. And you can get those boxes uh, brought up and, and look through them. Um, and it's actually looking through them, I have to admit, is pretty boring. So, like, what, like what a lot of research, um, a lot of it is tedious, but you've got to go through that tedious stuff to find out the interesting stuff. And um, if you're lucky enough, as you ride the Mississippi, you might see a few bald eagles uh, flying around as well. Uh, but obviously, some of the early stuff is in paper form, but a lot of stuff is online. So if you go to this URL, you can find amazing resources. They've got oral histories with all sorts of people from the history of computing. They're, they're fully transcribed. You can go and look at them. A lot of the archives and materials are online. So if you are interested in the history of computing, it's a great place to go and have a look. So how did Association of Computing Machinery start? Well, it started as Eastern Association of Computing Machinery with a meeting of 57 people who met in September 1947. Now, even at that time, there was a few people who thought, oh, well, we've got enough societies already, because obviously something like the IEEE had already got a sort of section for computing, and John von Neumann in particular was saying, oh, for heaven's sake, not another association, not another set of meetings to attend. But he um, actually was roped in and, and did give a few talks for SEM. So 57 people turned that inaugural meeting, and their aim was to advance the science and development of new machinery for computing, reasoning, and other handling. And they very quickly grew. Uh, they dropped the Eastern, and they became uh, ACM. And you know, they proved very popular, because people wanted to meet and discuss what they were doing. So the person who was most responsible for that first meeting, who set it up and got everybody going, was um, Edmund Berkeley. And he was the secretary of ACM for many of those early years. And he was actually the first person to write a popular book 
on computing, which he called giant brains and machines that think. So you'll notice the computer is actually um, plugged into the person's brain there. Um, so that was one of the things that he was um, most popular for. He, he was really keen to get the idea of computing out to the general public because he believed that computing is really logical and if people learn that logical reasoning and they apply it to other areas of their life, then the world will become uh, a better place. So that was his view, not shared by everybody. So how did he start off? He was, uh, an he was a brilliant mathematician. He sort of went to school early, went to university early and finished, and then ended up working as an insurance actuary, which he hated. He found it really, really boring. Um, but through that work, he did get involved in a little bit of computing. And then uh, when the Second World War happened, he was called up, but he worked as a naval reserve in the Harvard Computation Lab, where he worked alongside Howard Aiken and Grace Hopper, one of the most famous female programmers. After that experience, he was lucky enough actually to get a small inheritance which meant he didn't have to do his boring job as an insurance actuary anymore, and he could do what he actually wanted. So what he wanted to do was to write books, like Giant Brains and Machines That Thinks, and he also, if you like, developed the first home computers. So he worked on these kits where you could build your own computers, and he sold them to people. So he had one called Simon, and he had one called Brainiac. And this was back to his idea of getting the general public to understand computers, to be hobbyists. He, had, um, um, he published a magazine or a journal that he edited called Computers and Automation. And also, he was very socially active. And particularly, in, from 1958 onwards, he was active in the anti-nuclear mu movement. And he was particular um, organization he joined was a committee called SEN. So I mentioned he'd spent time at the Harvard Computational Lab. Now, here you see some of the people who worked there. Basically, um, during the Second World War, it was a great time to be um, a computer scientist um, if you wanted to get lots of money, because the American government generally realized that computers had a big role to play in winning the war, and they were prepared to put a lot of money on it. So a, a lot of money into it. So one of the people who, the man who ran the Harvard Computing Lab is stood there at the top of the a character called Howard Aiken. And what he had basically done is develop this Mark I computer, and what it did was very quickly do all these computational tables. So they were using that to work out things like the sort of magnetic resonance zone around ships, people at Los Alamos who were developing the nuclear bomb, we're also looking at the work of that computer. Now, by the time Edwin Berkeley um, joined them, they were actually working on the Mark II computer. And what that was trying to do was trying to calculate the sort of firing range of various um, missiles that you, you sent out. So, Aiken had been able to, if you like, put together a really crack team. So, Grace Hopper down there was a member of his team. She was a lieutenant in the Navy. Um, they also had um, uh, uh, civilians as well, so they worked very closely with IBM, so it was a joint mission, or at least for some of those times. So Aiken and, and Berkeley joined that team. Now, there was a bit of a personality clash, because Howard Aiken is renowned for being a very strong character. One historian described him as having a very imposing presence. He was well over six foot tall. He had piercing eye eyes and having beetling and satanic eyebrows. So <laughs> eyebrows <laughs> can be satanic. Um, he's supposed to possess them. But the idea was he was a, a, a very strong character. It said that when he met somebody, he would look at them and just rate them on a scale of one to 10. And when he met Berkeley, he uh, had him as a one. Grace Hopper, <laughs> fortunately, he did rate as a 10, and he said, she's a good man. So she was all right. <laughs> but even though Berkeley was, uh, was a brilliant mathematician, he was a little bit obsessive 
and this is one of the reasons Aiken took against him. Berkeley would take notes at every meeting. He would record everything. He ha actually went around with a date stamp, and as well as taking notes, he date stamped his notes. He was, it, one of the reasons that he was so clever is that he, he kept all these records. But this just didn't go well, down well at the Harvard Computation Lab. And one day they did um, play a not very nice trick on him, and that they stole his little date stamp from him, and they went to the men's room, and they got a toilet roll, and they stamped every sheet on the toilet roll with his date stamp, uh, something which he wasn't uh, very pleased with. <laughs> but, but, but he did um, have a good working relationship with uh, Grace Hopper, even if he didn't with Howard Aiken. Anyway, um, he had his time there, and then he really um, went back to sort of civilian life. And when the war finished and he went back to civilian life, what came about was really that now he had this inheritance and he could do what he liked. He could really indulge in one of his interests, which was social activism. He was chair of this uh, same nuclear policy. So some, what the main thing he was really concerned about was the use of computing technology and nuclear weapons, which he really felt was unsafe. He was also concerned about nuclear, nuclear radiation in general and the effect that it was having on the environment. So there was a lot of things about, you know, in, in, if you drink milk, there might be nuclear radiation in it. He was concerned about environmental issues, so in that he was maybe a little bit ahead of his time. But he was also concerned about global issues and all sorts of things. So what he really wanted to do was, he said, it's the responsibility of computer people to apply the technical expertise to improving society rather than just to war. He established a committee on the Social Committee of Computer Scientists. And when you look at his records, he was an ob obsessive record keeper. And that's why it's so good to research him, because everything's there. So if he picked up a pamphlet from an organization, say, um, for racial equality, he would file that pamphlet. There would, there would be a date on it. If he gave them a $5 donation, he would record that. So you know all the societies that he was involved in. And there was about 175. Um, so it was things like business executive for Vietnam peace, racial equality, conscientious objectors, all sorts of movements around the world. But the, his main focus was on anti-nuclear. Now, I mentioned they played a trick on him at the Harvard Computation Lab. Well, he could also play a few tricks himself. Um, so one of the things that he did when he didn't have quite enough articles for his journal, um, Computers and Automation, he would write an article as Neil MacDonald. So nobody, as it was his alter ego, so nobody knew for years and years that Edmund Berkeley and Neil MacDonald were actually the same person, but they were writing. But he was, he was a bit tricky, because Neil MacDonald would also write letters to, to the newspaper and to other journals, um, stating the views. And if anyone dared to spell Neil MacDonald's name wrong, if it was M.C. MacDonald, they would, he would write quite angry letters to them and demand that they published an errata. So he was having his, his little fun and games as well at the time of all of this. I did find, um, among all those records, that there was a New Zealand link, or right, a little bit tenuous. So there was one thing there, which is a press release um, from an organization called the Men of the Trees. And that was from its founder, the um, very grandly named Mr. Richard St. Barb Baker, who was the actual man of the trees himself. And what he was writing was a president, an appeal to the president of France, de Gaulle, for a dramatic tree planting program. But the point in the New Zealand connection was at the time he was writing, it was based in New Zealand, where he did write this book which was about the, the threat of erosion and deforestation in New Zealand. So New Zealand was kind of in there. Obviously, being involved too in so many different groups um, did throw Berkeley under suspicion. So in the late 50s, it was the time of McCarthyism. A lot of people were being investigated. There was a lot of publicity about reds under the beds. And people were being encouraged to speak out if they suspected anyone of being a communist. 
So some person who's not identified went up at a private gathering of the Navy and said the Navy should clean its skirts of Berkeley, who's a reserve, he was still a reserve officer. Berkeley was very proud of the fact that he'd been a reserve officer in the Navy during the war, and he definitely didn't want to give up that association. But he was very surprised one day, two Navy officers knocked on his door and handed him this huge writ with all these allegations that basically he'd been associating with communists, that he was a communist, he'd been carrying out all these activities. He very strongly defended himself in writing, because uh, what he really believed was, yes, I'm socially active, yes, I do um, talk about what I believe, I believe in free speech, but I'm definitely not a communist. But though he defended himself strongly against these charges, um, the Navy, at the end of the day after considering, decided, no, we do believe you've got these affiliations, and either you resign from the Navy or we're going to discharge you. So faced with that at the end of the day, he did submit his resignation and received an honourable discharge, but it did make him um, quite bitter um, about that and affected him for the rest of his life. So we've talked about Berkeley. Another character that we're going to look at is Daniel McCracken. So a little bit later, in 1965, he formed an organisation called Computer Professionals Against Anti-Ballistic Missiles. And their line was, we're not against anti-ballistic missiles per se, it's just that we don't believe the computing technology within it is really robust enough and trustworthy. And like Berkeley, he had some income because he was um, publishing all these best-selling computing textbooks, sort of introduction to COBOL and something, and they'd done very well, and he had a lot of royalties. So he decided to take the royalties he'd made from those books, form this organisation, and use the money to travel up and down the country, really speaking it out against the use of computers in anti-ballistic missiles. So that was something he was doing independently of ACM. He was active in ACM, and quite a bit later he became president, but this was independent activity. So it, was a f it had about 500 members, so it was quite a significant organisation. And in contrast um, to Berkeley, who was obsessive, McCracken was a very skilled politician. So, so even people who um, didn't agree with him would sort of compliment him on his political skills. He, he knew how to handle a, pe a meeting. Whereas Berkeley was somebody who was so passionate about his political beliefs, he didn't always, uh, wasn't always the most diplomatic person about approaching people. So we get to a point where, within the Association of Computing Machinery, things were coming to a head. So the late 60s in the USA were interesting times. There was a lot going on. Um, people were really starting to speak out against the Vietnam War uh, and feel that the US involvement in that had gone on long enough. And there were people within ACM who said, right, it's time for our organization to make a public stand and publicly state it against the Vietnam War. And on the other side, there were people who were saying, well, really, that's nothing to do with ACM. You might be against it in your personal life, but as, as an organisation that's about computers and technologies, the Vietnam War is a bit outside what we think about. The other event um, which made matters come to a head was the fact that ACM wanted to locate its um, National ACM Conference in Chicago. Now, what had happened in Chicago in about 1968 was there was a huge riot. So about that time, there'd been a lot going on in America. Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Robert Kennedy had been assassinated. There were riots in about 100 cities around the country. And in Chicago, um, what happened was a lot of people gathered together to have a demonstration against these things. Uh, there was about 10,000 demonstrators, and about, they were met by 23,000 police and National Guards. And they kind of met right in front of what was the big Hilton Hotel in Chicago, so it was very well publicised. And a lot of people felt that the police had mishandled the situation. There was a lot of controversy about it. And because of that, quite a few ACM members said, hey, 
we don't want to have a conference in Chicago. So they were quite a vocal voice. So it really came to a head and the organisation said, we're going to decide this matter once and for all, we're going to put this to the vote. Um, so also behind this idea of the vote was the tax status of the organisation. So by American standards, ACM was a 501c organisation. So that meant that um, you were not allowed to lobby to influence legislation. You're a scientific and education society with a concern for the public good. So what was at stake really was that if ACM stood up and said, we do want to lobby, we are going to comment on politics, that it would have financial implications because they would lose this uh, tax status. So the question they put to the vote is, shall the constitution be revised to comment on what they termed deeply political and social questions? So the deeply political and social questions they were looking at was, well, should we, com we comment on the Vietnam War and should we locate our conference in Chicago? And what came back was resoundingly, most members felt, no, we don't want to, we want to stay as a technical society. Uh, so it was eight, about 8,000 to 2,000 for that. And the, the president at the time, Bernard Galler, actually got a lot of letters from people who said, why are we even having this vote? It, it, it's inappropriate. We're a technical organisation. Um, these, these social issues are, are outside of what we do. And what he encouraged members to do said, well, if you're interested in politics, be interested in politics, be active through your church or through your local associations, but don't bring it into ACM. So in the same year, um, other events were taking place. So they decided to have um, a Silver Jubilee Founders Dinner. And it had been kind of forgotten at this time that Edmund Berkeley was one of the founders of the, the ACM, but somebody remembered it and said, look, let's celebrate these founders at our dinner. So the two founders they celebrated were Edmund Berkeley and Frank Alts were being honoured as the founders. And there were a few people who kind of said, well, Berkeley can be a little... Um, strong, do, do we kind of trust him? And I said, it'll be, it'll be all right. So you can imagine the situation of a very formal dinner. It was the ACM founders dinner. It was all um, sort of black tie for the men and the, the women in evening dress and everybody sat there. And there was a speech by Frank Alts who was talking on the theme of reflections and then a speech by um, Berkeley whose theme was horizons. Well, very quickly into Berkeley's speech, things started to go quite wrong. He called for an formation of the Association of Prevention of Doomsday. And he basically said that the use of computers in the use of Vietnam made him ashamed of belonging to the computer field. But then he started to get quite specific. He started to look around the room and actually point out the people who we all knew um, were working directly using computers for military technology. And he was actually pointing and naming to people. And particularly, there was one computer company called Honey, computer manufacturer called Honeywell, who was designing antipersonal vans, and he named them specifically. Now, at this point, Grace Hopper, who was a, a friend and colleague of Berkeley, decided she'd had enough. She was still involved in the Navy as the head of programming languages, and she got up and walked out. And she was followed mainly by the military folk that there. So the thing was a disaster. And the poor guy who was chairing it, um, Eric Weiss, was desperately trying to, to save the day. Um, and, and he proposed a toast to Berkeley. So the few people who were left um, gave him a toast. But he, he really, if you like, caused this controversy at this dinner. So even though they had had this question of importance vote and the organisation had resoundingly decided, no, we don't want to talk about social issues, issues didn't go away. So one of the things that popped up again was the Equal Rights Amendment. 
So the Equal Rights Amendment was some legislation in America that was basically going to give equal rights to um, women the same rights as men. So it had actually been around for a long time, since 1923. And there was quite a bit of controversy about it, um, because basically some people said, yes, it's a good thing. Basically, middle class women very much supported it. They said, yes, uh, women should have the same rights as men. But there was some movement against it from working class women, and that said it actually does give working class women some protection from sort of may maybe more demanding physical tasks like heavy lifting. Anyway, it was around, and at this time, it was before um, Congress. And there was a strong, strong pressure within people from ACM to say, we don't care if this affects our tax status. This is such a burning issue. Uh, there's some women working in computing, and we really want to make a stand and say we're in favour of it. So another character we're looking at was another um, ACM president, Peter Denning, who's very famous for his work on virtual memory and security. And he was very strongly in the camp that ACM was what he called a Switzerland among professional societies, that you might have your political views, but when you come to work together in a technical way, you leave your political views at the door and people of all colours and all political stripes can, can work together. And he felt it was very, very dangerous for a society that was still quite young at that time, only 25 years old, it wasn't as established as the physicist or the chemist, to actually be making these political stands. He, he really felt strongly that people should keep their politics outside. So he got a lot of flack from this. Um, he was called a male chauvinist pig, um, as a lot of people were at the time. Uh, even Jean Summit, who was a very senior female figure within ACM, though she personally supported the Equal Rights Amendment, felt it was very inappropriate for ACM to make a public comment on it. So she came in for a lot of flack as well. So in the end, they, they did not make a statement on it. And in fact, the Equal Rights Amendment has, ne has never been passed, because in American law, even if it's passed by Congress, it has to go through or be passed by all 52 states, and all 52 states have never actually passed it. But I don't think that was particularly caused by the SEM not making a statement. <laughs> so I mentioned Jean Samet before, and again, she was the first female uh, president of SEM. She's very famous as a developer of a, com a programming language called Formac, and she's basically an expert on programming languages. She um, is still with us, and at the time, she was seen as a very tough lady, because basically when she did become president, ACM was in a lot of um, financial difficulties, uh, but there were, within ACM, if you like, pockets of money. Some of the special interest groups were very large and had lots of money, so she basically had to get ACM on its financial feet again, and in doing that, she did have to be quite tough and made quite a few uh, enemies. Now, one issue that came up um, under her watch when she was SEM president was what they call the Turchin issue. So a lot of scientific and technical societies around America at that time were facing issues about um, Soviet scientists who were being persecuted at home and wanted to come to America, but the Soviet government was not letting them come to America. And Valentin Turchin was a Russian computer scientist, and he'd been head of a lab for automated systems building now in Russia. His, his lab had been closed down. He'd been taken in for interrogation six times. He, he was also a supporter of um, uh, Amnesty International. So basically, he was under pressure. And Columbia University in USA had offered him a post as a visiting scholar, but the Soviet authorities were not giving him an exit visa to leave Russia. So he couldn't work in Russia, and he wasn't being allowed to leave. So an American member of ACM paid for Turchin to his ACM membership and then brought it to the ACM Executive Council and said, can we make a public statement in support of Turchin being allowed to be given an exit visa and send that to um, Leonid Brezhnev uh, at the time? Now, this caused a huge furore. So it brought up the spectre of, hey, we already had the vote on 
um, a question of importance, we decided we wouldn't con uh, comment on social and political issues. Is he even a member of the ACM? It's just because somebody's paid his membership. So they basically had, had this meeting, and a lot of people were very angry in that it took up half the meeting time. So this was an executive council meeting. People like to travel across America, um, you know, stay in hotels, take part in this meeting. So it was a meeting when very important um, business took place. But this issue um, took up two hours or half the meeting time. There was 150 pages of paperwork involved. So the main person who was in support of them making a statement on Turchin at the time was Daniel McCracken, whereas the people who were against it were Jean Samet and... Peter Denning, who just felt it was inappropriate for them as an organisation to take these stance. And two of the representatives who were at the meeting, one from the North East region and one from New York, commented on these views. And they really show the, the kind of polar opposites. So Jerry Sultan from the North East region was very much in favour of SEM not making any comment on this issue. And he's saying, well, they're trying to say we're callous and reactionary. We don't think it's appropriate. Whereas Thomas Dioria, who was from New York, had the opposite view. He said, yes, definitely it's our moral duty to, to make this statement. We have an opportunity to help a fellow human being who's incidentally a computer professional. And we rose to that occasion. So they did make a public statement in support of Turchin being given an exit visa. But they didn't actually follow it up very strongly. They sort of said, right, we've made this statement, and Daniel McCracken was trying to get them to follow it up, but they, they, they sort of did it, but not followed through. However, um, the issue did keep coming up, and later in 1980, the ACM did establish a committee on scientific right, freedom and human rights, which was basically to help um, Soviet scientists and people from other Eastern Bloc and uh, South American countries who were facing persecution at home. And Anthony Ralston and another character called Jack Minka were instrumental in that. So people kept pushing and they did have the committee. And Valentin, Valentin Turchin did eventually immigrate to the USA in 1977 where he took up a, a position at uh, City University of New York. So those were the three issues. So one of the things that um, came out of it was ACM decided, right, we, we will set up a committee on computers and public policy, a committee that's still very active today. They drafted in Daniel McCracken as inaugural chair. And what the first thing he worked on was a list of issues concerning computers and public policy. So despite the vote against um, talking on deeply political and social issues, this was still a, a, a very well-debated topic. So when they had a panel on it at a conference, they got 150 people along to, to discuss it. So there was a lot of interest. So the kind of things people were concerned with was using computers in the home. There was a lot of thing that banking was beginning to be being computerised. People were concerned about that. Computer literacy, how to help people from maybe what you'd call um, more marginalised areas of society have access to those computer skills and how that would help them have social power. However, what they decided was, well, if we are going to talk about these social and political issues, they must have computer technologies at the centre of them, if it's appropriate for SEM to talk about them. And it must be in a way that if you know about computers, you can talk about something in a way that somebody who didn't know about computers couldn't. So if you're talking about computer-related privacy or something, you've got some insight which gives you um, maybe the reason to talk out about it when somebody else couldn't. Another way that ACM went was the formation of a special interest group, SIGCAS, which is Special Interest Group for Computers and Society, which started in 1969 and was particularly looking at ethics, security and privacy. So that was seen as the only group in ACM, well, by some people, where you could actually say, I'm not just about computers, but I'm also interested in how that creates the rest of the world. Now, at the beginning, they did have some difficulties. So when they first started up, they were saying they're not enough interest, we're going to be s dissolved. Now, this prompted a very strong statement from some New York-based members. Now, 
I'm not quite sure whether this statement was from the people who were um, forming Sig Castle Hall or just from this group in New York. I suspect it's just from this group in New York because it was a very strong statement. And it was actually published in a magazine called Interrupt, which was um, published by a group called Computer Professionals for Peace. And the co-chairman of that, Edward Elkind, was actually a an active and openly declared communist. So it's kind of coming out. And then they were saying, quite clearly, we oppose the war in Vietnam, um, the statement that SCM didn't make. We oppose discrimination as practiced in the computer field. So that was about e equal opportunities, if you like, for everyone being employed, not excluding people through tests and so on. We oppose the establishment of mass data banks. Again, that was a privacy issue. People at the time were very concerned about that. Um, we oppose exploitation of the uninformed by unscrupulous computer schools. So that was a big issue at the time. Somebody would just set up a computer school um, in a disadvantaged area, take money off people, say, oh, you finish this training, you'll get a job. And then at the end of the day, they maybe knew how to punch in a bit of data, but they didn't have a clue how to program. And they supported programs called the constructive application of computers to solve society's problems. So it was threatened with dissolution, um, but after these statements, the group did get together and form. However, because of those apprehensions that they would be taken over by what they termed these wild-eyed radicals, uh, the wider SCM group said, hey, we've got to put a few controls on, on this group because we don't know what is going. We'll make sure that the management of that special interest group are appointed by ACM, they've got an advisory panel of ACM, and if um, a lot of non-ACM members join that special interest group, which are allowed to, their votes can't count for more than half, because what they were worried about maybe was people from computer professionals from peace would kind of join that special interest group and make a takeover. However, by 1975, that was all calmed down and the group were allowed to select its own officers because it actually, actually, actually never came about. In fact, though the group was quite radical in the things it published at the beginning, um, there were articles about the use of computer technology in Vietnam. They reported Berkeley's speech at the Silver, Silver Jubilee dinner. After a short time, they were actually being challenged by their own members to say, Actually, you're not radical enough. At that, in that same dinner speech, Berkeley had dismissed them as an example of tokenism. They had a letter from, um, in their journal from someone called Richard Sprague who's saying, hey, I joined this group expecting it to be radical, and actually you're not very radical. You should be looking at things like, um, he particularly wanted them to look, take computer evidence from John Kennedy's assassination and sort of reinvestigate that. He was suggesting various topics. When the president of SIGCAS went to talk out to a student chapter, they said, well, you say all these things, but what is the group actually doing? And their response was, well, the management of this special interest group can't hope to talk for members um, unless we put everything to the vote. We've got this newsletter. It's a forum for discussion, and they welcome that forum discussion. In fact, um, what happened was that, in fact, the members of the group were a little bit passive. So at the time, it was quite cheap to join a special interest group. And if you looked at the members of ACM, a lot of them joined, were in multiple special interest groups. So there were SIGGAS members, but in fact, they weren't probably very radically active, most of them. But the main issue that they were concerned about was privacy. So on the one side, there's that very radical letter that was published in the Interrupt magazine. On the other side, when you looked at the evidence, at the time, uh, there was a lot of concern about privacy issues. This, they were setting up a national data bank. People were very concerned that all the data about them would be brought together in one place and the implications that would have. And their first chairman, um, a character called Robert Bigelow, was actually not a computer person as such, but an attorney who was interested in privacy issues. So it seemed that actually the main driver for the formation of that group was more about privacy than um, some of the more radical concerns like anti-Vietnam War and so on. And if you looked in 1977, they did a survey of their research interests. You can see that, yes, they are talking about the wider impact on society, but they're also um, 
equally interested in privacy issues and in ethical issues. If you look at what the conference panels they were uh, sponsoring, um, privacy was there, as was things like education and computing. So they did make strong contributions, but their contributions tended to be in privacy, as we already said, and also very strongly in education. They developed um, tertiary courses in computing and, computing and society so that anyone was doing a computer science degree, they were also likely to do uh, a module on computers and society. So they were made aware of the weather issues. They were particularly interested in developing computer training courses for what was termed at the time disadvantaged group, um, so black and Hispanic populations trying to get good computer training for them. They looked at the com use of computers to improve learning in schools and in universities and so on. They were also interested in computer use in healthcare and in ethical issues. And what about broader ACM? Well, what came out at the end of the day was ACM did engage in political issues. They did decide they had a contribution to make to public policy, but only when there was a clear uh, connection to computing, when computing was at the core. However, though I might have been critical of ACM, it's fair to say they were more prepared to consider a range of viewpoints than other professional societies like the chemists and the physicists, maybe because they were such a new organisation. And some things that they were broad agreement they should look at were things like privacy. They were very against the use of the US social security number as a universal identifier because it could tie all the information about you together. They have done a lot of work on improving education and the computing curricula and also in weeding out um, these poor, poor quality training um, schools who are offering fake training to people for a lot of money. I've talked about ACM. Um, so what was happening outside of ACM? Well, we know um, there was a society called Computer Professionals uh, for Peace, and their co-chairman, Edward Elkin, was a, a, a very committed character. He was a, a strongly declared... He, he was openly declared as a communist, and he didn't care who knew it. Uh, that was his belief. And as a consequence of that, he often didn't work. He only... Um, was able to get work for short periods of time as a computer programmer, and sometimes he didn't because people wouldn't have anything to do it. A more well-known organisation that was started a bit later is Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, which was around from 1983 to 2013. And that was basically started up by uh, two characters at Xerox Park, Severo Ornstein and Laura Gold, as a listserv. And the listserv became very active, and they began to meet face to face and they were thinking at the time because there was a lot of organisations like physicists for social responsibility and so on, do we really need another organisation? And then they decided that computer people were seen as, if you like, technical experts, as wizards. Um, so what they were against was strategic defence initiative or the, the Star Wars system put out by Reagan and they decided, yes, we do have contribution to make. So they formed this society, and it very quickly grew. Um, it had a global influence, and there was an affiliated group that was active in, in Christchurch at the time, though I don't know much about them. But as time went on, they were not just looking at military use of computers, they looked at m more wider social applications, at ICT for, for development, and so on. But it was interesting that even though they started out in 1983, which was later than the period I've been talking about, at that time, um, what they found was that com the, the perception of computer people was that they had no s social concerns. They were technical wizards. If you thought of a person who worked in computing, you didn't think of somebody who was interested in politics. And that was the perception of the broader public, and that's the perception that they met. So I'd just like to finish with um, a parable of the three bricklayers, which was a favourite of Edmund Berkeley. So you've probably heard this before. You ask the bricklayers what they're doing, and the first one says, I'm laying bricks. The second one says, I'm building a straight wall. And the third one says, I'm building a cathedral. So Doug Schuller, who was an, one of the founder members of Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, applied this to a community networker. 
So you ask three community networkers what they're doing. The first one says, I'm setting up a mail distribution list and some web pages. The second one says, I'm working with a social service agency to develop community projects. And the third networker says, I'm helping to build a new society. So I have some references if you want to follow this up. There's a very good book on Edmund Berkeley by Bernadette Longo, another a good one about physics and missile defence and some others coming out. I'd just like to thank you for asking me to talk and thanks to Charles Babbage Institute for hosting me. The ACM gave me a small award to do research and my university. And I'd just like to leave you with this question in your mind. Where do you stand? Are you with um, people who think like Gene Samet and Peter Denning? So all, all the people I've talked about were very intelligent people. They're all very moral people. They all gave a lot of their time to developing the computing profession, but they had different beliefs. So Gene Samet and Peter Denning just felt computer work and politics should be kept separate. You could be political, but don't bring it into your working life. And then on the other hand, you've got Daniel McCracken and Berkeley, who saw it as their moral duty to influence society in their area of technical expertise. So I'd just like to leave you with that question in your mind today. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Time for a few questions. Raise your hand, make me run. Doctor, doctor did you find any evidence of uh, government uh, influence in keeping this organization, the ACM, separate from political concerns? Well, I think the main influence was through that tax status, which is used for a lot of organizations like that. They give them this tax status, they get tax breaks, and that means that they can't lobby. So there's always that threat that if you start to lobby, you'll get your tax status taken away. And, and, and societies are very concerned about that. So there's n no direct examples of someone from the government going to, t t to talk to them specifically, but that, w that was the main way that these things were controlled. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, Janet. Okay.